Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Rethink Labs uh, webinar panel discussion on fairness in justice use of machine learning in pretrial detention. Uh, my name is Eric Geisels. I'm a professor of economics at UNC Chapel Hill, a professor of finance at the Keenan Flagler Business School, and I'm the faculty research director of the Rethink Labs uh, of the Keenan Institute, which is hosting this event. Uh, we have a wonderful panel. Um, uh, the moderator will be today will be Professor uh, Faye Kopp Payton. Uh, she is on rotation with the National Science Foundation and is a professor of information systems and technology at NC State. Uh, her research interests uh, include data quality and bias uh, in artificial intelligence. Uh, along with me, uh, uh, we have two other uh, wonderful uh, panelists. Um, We'll be joined by Jessica Smith, who is the Keen Distinguished Professor of Public Law and Government at UNC's uh, School of Government. Um, and where she's at the School of Government, she serves as the director uh, for the Criminal Justice Innovation Lab. Uh, as such, she works uh, throughout actually the state of North Carolina to support stakeholders as they work to improve state and local bail systems. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Julia Angwin. Uh, she is the editor in chief and founder of The Markup, uh, a nonprofit newsroom that investigates how powerful institutions uh, are using technology to change our society. Uh, prior to that, prior to being uh, with The Markup, she uh, led investigative uh, teams at ProPublica and uh, The Wall Street Journal. So, with that great panel, um, let me uh, suggest the following structure for this panel discussion. I'm going to start off uh, with a bit of a, a, a summary of ongoing research regarding machine learning and pretrial detention, uh, followed by um, uh, uh, Jessica and Julia, who will uh, talk about the, about the subject as well. And then we will sort of have a back and forth uh, uh, as, a, as, pa as a panel with uh, moderate, uh, our moderator, uh, Faye will moderate the panel. And then at the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, please feel free during uh, the presentations to field your questions in the uh, chat uh, at the bottom of your uh, screen. And then at the end, uh, we will uh, address some of the questions from, from the audience. So with that being said, uh, let me share my screen uh, and, and talk a little bit about uh, research. Uh, the, the work that I'm actually going to be talking about um, is generic. Uh, it's a, it addresses uh, bias issues um, um, in machine learning algorithms. Uh, and the application that we actually have uh, is on uh, pretrial detention. Um, uh, racial issues. Uh, it is joint work with my colleague, Andre Bobby, uh, in the Department of Economics at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Shi Chen, who is a, a former um, PhD student of mine, and Rohit Kumar, who is uh, at the ISI in, in, in Delhi. Um, so I said that we actually talk about um, algorithmic discrimination in broadly as a starting point. So that applies to many decisions that are life-changing, uh, college admission, loan approvals, pre-trial detention, ad deliveries, etc. cetera. Uh, it's been widely covered in, um, in, in the press. Uh, here is an example of uh, a publication in The Guardian talking about Amazon ditching their um, AI recruitment tool uh, as it had uh, built-in biases. Um, here's another example that was published by uh, Nature uh, on um, the uh, biases in healthcare algorithms, uh, uh, particularly uh, affecting uh, black people. And the last example is um, uh, the one on uh, pretrial detention that was co-authored by uh, Julio is actually on the panel. It was uh, published by ProPublica uh, about the biases against uh, African-American uh, people who are uh, um, in, uh, facing pretrial detention decisions. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion in computer science on 
um, dealing with algorithmic biases. And the response of uh, computer scientists is that they have, uh, they came up with a number of uh, restrictions uh, or definitions of what, what should be a fair uh, decision function or decision rule uh, in an algorithm. algorithm. And uh, I'll just give you a few examples. Um, there's, there are many of them. And in fact, some of those conversations are between computer scientists and philosophers uh, on the notion of fairness. Uh, statistical parity, which appears here on the screen, is one that just says uh, there should be equal portion, proportion of defendants uh, are detained uh, in, uh, in each group, uh, group being here uh, uh, the different uh, 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 ethnic parts of the, of the um, population. Uh, there is conditional statistical parity where you condition on, say, legitimate uh, risk factors. Uh, there is predictive equality, and these are just three examples. Uh, there are many others uh, actually are used uh, in, in the computer science literature. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, also shown in the computer science literature is the fact that if you actually uh, try to uh, put these restrictions together, uh, you become, uh, there's something called an impossibility theorem, is that uh, it is actually Im impossible to satisfy all these restrictions. And so we are coming from a different angle. Um, we, meaning people in the legal profession, as well as economists, um, we're used to talk about cost-benefit analysis. Uh, there is a well-established uh, fair practice, uh, good practice in what, what is actually a, a reasonable, good approach to cost-benefit estimates. And so our, our way to think about um, machine learning and biases and dealing with them or correcting for them is to first think uh, about the costs and the benefits of the decisions that we're actually making. Uh, and um, when, when I mean by that is that we're gonna actually impose explicit costs and benefits uh, and they, they, are, they may differ and they should differ uh, across uh, the different parts of the population, including uh, protected uh, minorities. Now, when you do that, um, you're gonna actually, it's not like what computer scientists have been thinking about imposing some generic and uh, omni applicable restrictions on, on uh, prediction rules or decision rules. Uh, what we're instead saying is, well, uh, depending on the context, uh, you have different uh, costs and benefits and also actually uh, depending on different parts of the country um, the costs and benefits might be for, within the same application might be different now what, what are we meaning by costs and benefits well it, we're talking about classification problems that's the language of machine learning meaning binary decisions uh, are you keeping someone in jail for during the pretrial period or are you releasing this person that's a binary choice loan applications is the same college admissions is the same so we're talking about binary classification problems and in binary classification problems you sort of have this uh, what, what we would call a two by two matrix of uh, the true positives, the true negatives, the false positives and the false negatives. Uh, think about, since this, we're talking about a lot about COVID, think about a COVID test. Uh, if you have a positive test and you do have COVID, that's a true positive. If you have a negative test and you don't have COVID, that's a, negative, that's a true negative. If you have a, um, a positive test, but you don't have uh, a COVID, that's a false positive. And, 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 and the fourth one is, is the false negative. In the pretrial detention application, this is about uh, keeping someone in jail who would not recommit another crime uh, or keeping one in jail uh, if you uh, uh, correctly hold the people in jail who are uh, um, prone to commit another crime. So you have these, again, these false positives, uh, true positives and false negatives and true negatives. They have costs releasing the wrong person or keeping the wrong person in jail have true costs. 
and uh, these are expressed by these four uh, uh, corners in this in this uh, binary choice uh, classification problem and you can actually start thinking explicitly about uh, costs and benefits of each of these uh, four outcomes and actually in uh, uh, the case of uh, pretrial detention, we actually have that kind of analysis done by legal experts, not only economists, to which, to which I'll come uh, uh, soon. And again, we can actually differentiate what is X here in this, um, in the, in this uh, example is um, whatever what we call covariate of features uh, are, and that can include uh, racial uh, diversification. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to, I'm just going to talk, there's a very technical paper and that technical paper is available on the um, Rethink Labs website. Uh, we're just using this as a, uh, besides the theory, a, an illustration of it using the Compass uh, ProPublica uh, the ProPublica data set, the, the reason why we're using this data set, this is a data set that uh, is widely used, it's in the public domain, it covers Broward County, it's a large number uh, of uh, cases of criminal defendants, and we're looking at uh, only African Americans versus Caucasian uh, defendants uh, in our data set. Uh, we could um, look at uh, female versus male, we could look at uh, other uh, uh, issues regarding discrimination, but we're focusing on the, the racial one. Um, just about co cost and benefits, uh, this is a study in a Boston Law Review that gives exactly numbers on how it, how expensive it is for society. By the way, when I talk about cost, I'm talking about both cost to individuals as well as uh, society. So there are uh, public costs as well, individual costs. We, we are using some of these numbers in, in, uh, in our analysis. Uh, just to wrap this up, what we find, first of all, I should also add, I haven't said that on the technical side, we're pretty agnostic about which, alg alg uh, which kind of machine learning methods uh, we're using. Um, whatever we, we kind of uh, think about cost and benefits ultimately can be applied uh, to logistic regression, deep learning, shallow, shallow learning, uh, 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 boosting, whatever technique that you can actually want uh, um, to apply it to. Um, we uh, look at the different cost and benefits and we differentiate for costs for African-American versus Caucasian defendants. What we find is we find a 13% reduction of our, what we call preference uh, based, which is asymmetric costs uh, functions compared to the standard uh, deep learning classifications uh, when, when we do uh, 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 deep learning um, uh, application. When we do logistic regression, it's a 10% reduction. And uh, we keep more criminals in jail, release slightly less people, and release less the wrong people, and thereby reduce recidivism uh, with, with, uh, with this uh, cost-based uh, approach. So the punchline is that what we sort of think about as a way to, to think about uh, racial justice uh, uh, and pretrial detention is to be really explicit about cost and benefits, both to the individual and society and the individual's family as well. Uh, that's part of the cost analysis. Um, that means you need domain expert input uh, and that will vary depending on the application when you're talking about college versus applications versus medical treatments, etc. Being a, a, uh, explicit about uh, cost and benefits uh, changes completely the actual uh, implementation uh, of the machine learning uh, algorithms because we are basically training the algorithms uh, on, a, on, on a training data sets where the costs and benefits are explicitly taken into account. And I think that's important because we have a long established um, uh, practice of thinking about costs and benefits in the legal profession and economics. And so we, we can kind of tap into that tradition uh, in terms of uh, uh, thinking about uh, correcting uh, algorithmic biases. Uh, with those points, uh, I'll leave it up to, uh, uh, that was sort of an introduction uh, to talk about say, existing research. Thank you. I think I, 
uh, have kept it as short as possible. <laughs> Uh, Faye, you're taking over as, as uh, I am. moderator? I am. So Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Eric. Okay. So based on that presentation, um, I want to start with a few questions, uh, Julia and, and Jessica. But Julia, do you have something that you were going to present? No, I'm not presenting. I just okay. talk. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we go. So uh, first question I have up for you, um, Jessica. And so the question is, Based on what Eric has presented, um, he spoke a lot about the algorithm, spoke a lot about the public data set, um, and this idea of cost benefits, and quite frankly, the limitation of just looking at what computer scientists say um, in terms of theoretical models around um, fairness. Um, and he talked about statistical parity and the like. But when it comes to what you have seen, how have you seen algorithmic decision making in pretrial detention evolving in your work? Sure, thank you. I'd be I'd be happy to feel that and I promise I'll get to your question. Yeah. But but there is there is something I think needs to be said before getting to the answer. Yes. And and the thing that I think needs to be needs to be well, or asked is why are we even talking about algorithms yes. in this context? Because, um, you know, structured decision making tools, whether they be empirical or non empirical, are not a solution in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. There is a problem that mm -hmm. we have in our pretrial system. Stakeholders have come to understand there are serious issues that need mm -hmm. correction in the system. And let's just be clear at the outset about what we're talking about. We're mm -hmm. talking about detention of about a half a million people pretrial uh, yes. every day. That's about 20% of the nation's mass incarceration. These are people who have not been convicted of a crime. So mm -hmm. no shade on Eric, but we shouldn't be calling them criminals. They're people who are presumed innocent and they've been charged with a crime and being charged yeah. with another I didn't, crime. I didn't call them criminals. Oh, I record. love it. This is great. I love <laughs> the way this is starting out. I mean, that it, it said more criminals. In, 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 I'm just, this, is, this is an important point for people to understand that people end up in jail pre-trial when they've been charged with a crime but before they've been convicted so the system is impacting lots and lots of people and also the way it currently functions is actually undermining public safety mm -hmm. we have a largely money-based bail system which means that money is the ticket out of jail as right. a result we have dangerous people who have money who can bond out and can continue their activities but meanwhile lower risk people end up in jail, not because they present a risk of new crime, not because they present a risk of failing to appear, but because they can't pay their bond amounts. And it's not large bond amounts that's okay. keeping them incarcerated. Our research shows that people remain incarcerated on bond amounts as low as $500. And in addition to the public safety impact of letting the dangerous people out, there's research that shows when these lower risk people are detained pre-trial, once they're finally released, they're more likely to commit crime. The research doesn't answer why, but everybody I work with knows the answers. They lose their jobs, they may lose their housing, their families yes. fall apart, putting them at risk for additional crime. So not only do we have this sort of criminogenic effect of unnecessary detention, but we're spending a fortune doing it. Detaining okay. a lot of people who really don't need to be detained, conservative estimates put it about $14 billion a year. And so in addition to the large number of people, in addition to detentions that are wealth-based as opposed to risk-based, um, in, in addition to the undermining public safety, we've got racial disparities, which have been mentioned in the, con in the context of the algorithms already. And of course, we know those disparities matter deeply for people, for the human beings that are involved, but they also have this pernicious effect on the system, which is that they undermine confidence in the mm -hmm. systems, its institutions, its actors, and fundamentally in the rule of law, which is our building block, our foundational element. For, for our civic society. And that's the background for why we're talking about 
structured decision-making tools, whether they're empirical algorithm tools or whether they're non-empirical tools, we have stakeholders across the nation who see these problems and who are looking for legal and evidence-based solutions to address the public safety, the inefficient use of taxpayer resources, the unfairness issues and the racial equity issues. And we should add now the litigation risk because of the lawsuits in our current wave of bail reform. So you asked, Faye. I so, so, that. yeah. So, so, okay. So, premature, so I, I appreciate that. I really do. Because aside from the questions, I have lots of questions, right? And so can we get Julia in here to respond to what Jessica has said, plus what Eric presented? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really happy to be here. You know, um, I led the research at ProPublica that, mm -hmm. you know, built this data set. And, you know, just so people know, um, that is a lot of work, right? So we took six months of legal fighting to get Broward County to release to us 18,000 scores that were assigned to people at pretrial. And then we spent six months looking up each one of those people's criminal records and their criminal um, future arrests and winnowed it down to the data set that, um, Eric analyzed, which was basically people for whom we could show whether or not the recidivism prediction was correct. And I just wanna talk a little bit about that because that's actually really important because when we talk about criminals and criminal recidivism, we're actually talking about this score, the COMPAS score claims to predict whether you'll be arrested for a future crime within the next two years. We looked at people's two years worth of free time. So we had to remove time from their lives when they were incarcerated. So when everyone had two years worth of available time in which to be arrested. And so just to be clear, a future arrest is not actually a future crime. <laughs> and so this score is aiming to predict whether you'll be arrested in the future. And it doesn't actually claim to measure whether you're going to be convicted and whether that is actually a true measure, whether arrests are a true measure of criminality is something that I think is very uh, controversial. So given that, this score is not very accurate, right? Our, you know, one of our findings uh, that is actually pretty shocking to me and is not talked about as much is that it was 60% accurate on the metrics that it claims, right? 60% is a little bit more than a coin toss, right? Mm -hmm. And on violent crimes, which was really what people are very concerned about when they're talking about pretrial detention, it was actually wildly inaccurate. It was 20% accurate. So, so this is not a score that is particularly accurate. And that shouldn't be so surprising to people because we're in a world of algorithms. Like you use an algorithm, like Google Maps tells you where to go. Well, sometimes Google Maps is wrong. And we know that. And sometimes your Google search results are wrong. And like, we're just early in algorithms. And so like the idea that an algorithm that can barely get you where you're going is going to then per perfectly protect future human behavior, which actually hasn't been able to be predicted before. Psychologists used to try to predict violent crimes and they were terrible at it, right? So like, we're actually just not good at predicting future human behavior in general. And so I kind of, I, I do want to support Jessica's point, which is like, why are we using algorithms for this? Like, that is actually a very good question. They're not that accurate, definitely racially biased, and um, it's not clear what purpose they're serving. You know, and I think the real, the truth of the matter is that as, as I understand it from my reporting, the reason they exist is that there was a good faith effort to reduce mass incarceration and people wanted to say, science is allowing us to release only safe people. And there, that's a, that actually was sort of a bit of the movement, right? Like here's a science tool that will like allow us to have the political cover to release more people. And I sort of, I get that, but when you look at who it's releasing, you know, the real true findings that we had in our analysis was that it was over predicting criminality for black defendants and under predicting criminality for white defendants. And so that is a pretty biased tool. And that mm -hmm. means that the whole bias that's already baked into our criminal justice system would then be reinforced when we decarcerate. And so that's a real bummer of an outcome. <laughs> okay. All right, so I still haven't gotten to my question, right? <laughs> still haven't gotten to my question because you brought up a lot of points, both you and Jessica, to Eric's point, and, and Julia, you mentioned this, the underfitting, overfitting. What does that mean for your model, Eric? Because this is what Julia is, this is the point that she's talking about. And secondly, 
Jessica mentions a very good point that is rarely touched on. People don't really want to talk about it. Like there's some historical significance, right, to this, particularly when we're talking about racial equity, right? And, and how does the model not capture that and what does that mean? So Eric, let me, let me give that question to you. How do you respond to the underfitting and overfitting issue that Julia points out? Well, the thing is that uh, the traditional machine learning models uh, define overfitting and, and underfitting in a very crude way. It's also what Compass does, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the many algorithms that are around. Um, by just uh, assessing the, the probabilities of uh, true uh, 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 false negatives and false positives uh, uh, and balancing them with the true negatives and the true, uh, true positives. It, it's a very statistical sort of uh, mm -hmm. how accurate are we? What we're actually saying is, well, let's put costs to that. How costly is it uh, uh, to uh, keep someone uh, uh, in a pretrial detention who is unlikely to uh, to actually uh, recommit a crime. Um, there are numbers for that um, in the sense that we have dollar numbers actually as opposed to assessments of probabilities. M most of the uh, existing machine learning models are just looking at probabilities and how well we are relative to the realized pro uh, outcomes, the frequency of, of events. Uh, I think um, as economists and as lawyers, uh, which is mostly the audience that we're, that we're targeting here, we are used to think, I mean, uh, I think um, Jessica mentioned $14 billion. We're, we, we are used to think about numbers, about how much it costs and how costly mistakes are. So I am much more uh, in favor of thinking it in terms of those conversations, uh, what it costs to uh, the individuals as well as to societies. Um, cost in terms of loss of, loss of jobs. It, it, part of the, uh, one of the arguments that Jessica made was people lose their jobs. Yeah. That's part of the cost benefit analysis that you have to I I impute. Th that is, I think, a productive uh, conversation we can have um, and it is a conversation that is much easier to have for a lot of people who don't understand any of these algorithms. Mm -hmm. Some of these algorithms are extremely opaque. Um, deep learning algorithms in general are not particularly well liked by regulators notably because there is not really a, a very clear understanding of cause and effects and how the internally these models work. But we are all much more comfortable with talking about budget numbers and implications of mistakes. And I think that's a healthier conversation to have. Um, that's answering your question about you know, mistakes. Um, there is a little bit of a challenge here that was brought up by both Jessica and, and Julia about should we begin to think about algorithms in the first place. I mean, yes. we're, we're, we're down that road, aren't we? And I, I, was, I kind of mm -hmm. started with that. Um, mm -hmm. The question I think that we should ask is, what's, is it better than the, the current situation, the current uh, human-based, very heterogeneous, biased system that we have? I'm, I'm not a, a legal expert. I don't work in, in this area of uh, pretrial detention. So Jessica and Julia know more about it. But my mm -hmm. understanding is that the system is broken and, and, I, and it's pretty clear. We are heading in a world where a lot of the decisions are going to be made by algorithms. And that's not just in pretrial decisions. Um, we, I don't think we can easily stop that. Uh, the question I think is, then how is it, what is the intelligent acceptable use of algorithms? And so I, I, would, I, would ha, I would rather have that conversation than just starting to, to argue that maybe we shouldn't have algorithms, but that's my personal view on that. Okay, so can I come back to my original question to Jessica, right? Yeah. What have you seen and, yeah. and how is it evolving? Yeah, and let me just clarify, I don't have a dog in the fight about whether we use them or not. I'm interested in any tools that get us towards 
better Thank public you. safety, a fair and effective system, and economic prosperity for all people. So okay. I'm open to any options, you know, to, to get us there. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll answer answer your question. You know, given that every single state in the nation has its own criminal justice system, uh, it's not surprising that we have a tremendous amount of variability across the country. You know, we've got red states like Wyoming with a population under 600,000 and we've got blue ones like California with nearly 40 with nearly 40 million. There are some states where the whole state has moved towards using risk assessment in the pretrial context. There are other jurisdictions like here at home in North Carolina where there's no statewide rule and it's left up to the individual judicial districts, local judicial districts to decide. Here in North Carolina, which is a pretty significant state in terms of population and a type of diversity that mirrors the country. So we can kind of use it as a microcosm for jurisdictions that haven't adopted it, either adopted or rejected it wholesale. There are really only a, a handful of counties that use empirical risk assessment. Um, Mecklenburg, North Carolina's largest county, uses the PSA court tool. Orange County, where, we, where UNC is located, um, has adapted the Virginia pretrial risk assessment tool for local purposes. Other jurisdictions that I've worked with on bail reform projects have actually rejected it and they've gone in a different direction and we're developing a body of evidence showing that their choices of turned out to be getting them the types of objectives they, they wanted to see. But since the tools were first in, introduced, there mm -hmm. has been a lot of learning, Faye. And there, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many changes that we could talk about, but I'll just give one example. Please. When they, when they first were adopted, it was really common practice that the risk scores were used to categorize people into low, medium, or high risk. But those are subjective judgments about whether someone's a low, medium, mm -hmm. or high risk. And people often didn't understand what that meant. I went and visited in the state of Kentucky, for example. I spent about a week there shadowing and attending proceedings where these tools were being used. And I interviewed decision makers and advocates after. And I sat in on one session where a judge, you know, in case after case was looking at the risk assessment. And I asked him, I was like, when they tell you it's a medium risk, what do you think that means? And he said, well, I think that means there's a 70% chance they're gonna either get charged with a new crime or you know, fail to appear. In fact, the data showed it was a 70% chance of success. Mm -hmm. And yet that's how yeah. medium, so now the best practices are, you don't use those terminology, you present, um, decision makers with the actual, actual percentages that mm -hmm. would apply. And that's just one small example of, of some of the changes that, that have been made, made over time. Um, the use also dramatically varies in terms of court level. You know, these are, these are expensive tools to implement. They require mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of time and resources. And so the, the first decision that happens for bail in some jurisdictions, they simply don't have the resources to implement risk assessment there. It, maybe it's not implemented until later at a mm -hmm. judge stage where there's a smaller number of cases and there are the resources available to do it. Um, there isn't a single jurisdiction in North Carolina that implements it at the first bail decision immediately after arrest. Every jurisdiction here that does it, does it at the, at the later stage um, before a judge in Orange County, for example, they have a different, uh, a non-empirical structured decision-making tool at the very first decision. And then they use the, that modified Virginia tool at the, at the judge stage. So um, there's really a tremendous amount of variation across the country. There's been a lot of learning. Um, mm -hmm. just, just today, uh, I think it was yesterday, um, there was a new, new guidance came out on implementing the you know, Arnold Risk Assessment Tool and some best practices and implementation. So things continue, continue to evolve, but there's a lot of variation. Um, and then of course, the, some of the variations simply driven by resourcing issues. Okay, all right. So Julia, um, if you want to respond to that, that's great, but I do have to ask you this question. Obviously there are lots of problems. Obviously there's lots of bias in the algorithms, um, even bias in the data. But now that we know better, what can we do to get better? And how do you define what is better? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, as a journalist, I, I don't really wade into like policy recommendations too much, but I would say mm-hmm. that like, it's pretty obvious that the way, the, the tool that I looked at Compass, like mm-hmm. um, as, you know, Eric was saying, like you can adjust the dials, like you could turn the false positive rate down and the, you know, and saying, you know what, that's not acceptable to us as society to have this such a high false positive rate um, and uh, for black defendants, right? It's really unfair. And so you would end up, ter- you know, making it less accurate in some other way, but really balancing for racial bias. And the, that's what's nice about algorithms is it does make your biases explicit, right? Like for humans, our biases are baked in and you can't see them and each judge is different. Um, for the these systems, if you can examine them, which I have to say, like, you know, my examination of Compass is still unique. It took me four people in a year and no one has done another one. So like, we don't know how many how many of the tools are like this. And honestly, like there isn't a lot of independent assessment of them, right? The right. companies do their own and, you know, publish their white papers, but like independent assessment is, is different. And so- And difficult. And, and difficult. Rare. And honestly, and like who's going to fund it, right? Like, right. I mean, I basically started a whole newsroom so I could do this kind of work, right? And like, that's a tiny little newsroom with 20 people and um, and we're the only ones. So, um, and at best we would do one of these every couple of years, right? So um, so there's not a lot of independent assessment. And, I, and, I, and the thing that's been surprising to me is that the debate since um, we published this story was in 2016, it's been almost five years. And like, honestly, there hasn't been, um, I would have thought there would have been a tool where they would, adjust the dials and say, okay, let's turn off the, the bias. And, 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 and there've been proposals like Eric's proposal of adding in cost benefit analysis is in, it's an interesting proposal, right? It's, it's yet another societal value that you might want to add into the algorithm, right? And I think it's perfectly fair to add those values into the algorithm, but I, I still just remain unsure about the use of algorithms because of due process, because the thing is, we have this idea of due process as being something you get at trial, right? That's where you get to hear both sides and you make your argument, but nobody goes to trial anymore. Pre-trial detention is your trial, right? Like there's not, very few people get to anything beyond that. That's that's basically the, the lead into the negotiations for your plea. And so it is unclear to me how you argue with an algorithm, right? Like if you've been judged as a seven, or whatever, or 70% risk or whatever, if it's not low risk or whatever, how, what are your rights as, you know, to argue against that? And to, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in a criminal justice, I just a reporter who covers this, but to me, that is a question that I just don't really find being answered very easily. Mm-hmm. The guardrails. Yeah. The guardrails, okay. Um, Eric, did you have a comment? I saw you came off of mute. Yeah, I mean, um, we should also acknowledge that actually the collection of data is very not not only the the yes. the, the the decision making across the U.S. is very uh, heterogeneous and and very uh, different across uh, within states and across states, but also the data that we actually collect, uh, from what I understand, is very different as well. So. Uh, it's there's no one size fits all kind of approach uh, across the different jurisdictions. Um, so besides yeah. the fact that the, the data is also baked in biases. Uh, Can I just jump in on one thing on that? Sorry, um, but I do want to say like we've mentioned a couple of times machine learning, deep learning. None mm-hmm. of these systems are that. Just to be very clear, <laughs> like these are questionnaires. And they have the algorithms are weighted linear equations. So okay. just to be very clear, there is a world of machine learning algorithms out there. That is not the world of criminal risk assessment. So it's also just not um, it's not something that I don't know of a single one that's like that. And I, that would be interesting because a machine learning algorithm actually would learn from the outcomes and get better over time. That is not what these systems are. OK, so so you're saying that you, we got to an answer on the better, right, at least touching on it. And Eric mentions, though, the data are different, uh, the data in and of itself. It, there, there's, but these are beyond what is happening in pre-child detention is beyond just data bias, right? There are other biases associated with that. And so, Jessica, I'd like to pivot to you um, about this idea of how does the court or district choose? I, I won't say machine learning. I'll say the algorithmic software that it uses. How do the courts choose? Yeah. And what's the onboarding and the, t- 
And you know, what is central and baked into this is who's designing the software? Who's, you know, who's doing the data curation? But, but beyond that, let's, let's focus on this question of how does a court or a district decide on what software application to use? Yeah, well, of course, they're making the first decision about whether they want to do it. But assuming right. that they want to, yes. um, you know, there are there are a number of factors that are going to have to be considered, and mm -hmm. cost and resources simply cannot be ignored. You know, these court systems are large, typically underfunded systems. In North Carolina, the court system is the third branch of government, and it receives less than three percent of the general fund. Mm -hmm. You know, to to support its operation. So there's not a ten doesn't tend to be a lot. Of extra money sluicing around the system, but that's an issue. There's the PSA tool, which is a common one used in the country that looks, looks solely at um, information that in theory can be pulled from administrative data. So what a person's prior record was, prior um, failures to appear in court, and things of that nature. In theory, in theory, that can all be pulled from the court system record. There are other tools, like the Virginia model that I've also mentioned, that requires an interview Mm -hmm. Now, requiring an interview requires people to conduct an interview and gather the information and all of that. So resourcing can be one issue that folks have to account for. You also need technology to do this. You need a technology platform for entering the data, doing the scoring, tracking results, reporting to judicial officials. You also have to validate the risk assessments. You know, there are some jurisdictions that just take them and use them, but a tool that was adopted and, and um, the predictive analysis was run in San Francisco is not necessarily going to work in Hyde County, North Carolina, you know, because populations are different, crime rates are different. I mean, there's just so many factors that are, that are different. And that's an expensive process as well. It can take tens of thousands of dollars to actually execute a validation on a risk assessment. And the traditional um, evaluations would be looking at things like how predictive are they the accuracy of the predictions but increasingly now stakeholders want to know how does this come out in terms of racial equity issues is mm -hmm. it perpetuating is it exacerbating mm -hmm. is it you know helping to address racial equity issues um, there are also companion materials that have to be produced which means that there are resources it's not like a decision maker just takes our risk score and uses it. Best practices call for there to be some type of release matrix or other tool that gives guidance to decision makers on how they would then use the risk scores. And they're typically kind of grid-based type of tools where say the y-axis is risk score one and the x-axis is risk score two, and then arrayed across the grid are various levels of pretrial release conditions with the least restrictive, released simply on a written promise for the lower risk people and with um, supervision levels rising. But someone has to create that tool. Local uh -huh. stakeholders have to get together and they have to adopt um, that tool. Then there are procedures that have to be put in place. You know, no one that I know advocates using these as a rule. Um, these are meant to be tools to help decision makers. That means decision makers have discretion. So maybe we need to think about should there be limitations on discretion? Should there be documentation required in exercise of discretion? But there need to be procedures for all of those things. And then, of course, there's the training issue. Um, mm -hmm. These are not, these, the, the results that come out of these tools are, it's not immediately apparent in all cases how to use them. And I worked in one jurisdiction where they started the tool, they just started producing these reports for judges and the judges didn't know what to do with them. They didn't mm -hmm. understand how to interpret the results. They didn't understand potential limitations or qualifiers on the results. So everybody needs training, not just the judges, but the defense lawyers need training, the prosecutors Absolutely. need training, because these things are going to be used in an adversarial hearing in which people have procedural rights, mm -hmm. um, due process rights, council rights, a whole 
a whole bucket load of constitutional rights. So we need to make sure that everybody understands, you know, how the tool was developed, how it was validated, um, and then everyone has appropriate training. And then once it's done, even if you've done all that, you're still not finished because situations change, populations change, crimes change, people's behavior change. So you need to keep examining and validating. So all of those things have to go into, you know, making this decision. And it is not a quick one. I think initially people thought, oh, we're going to have this tool. It's going to spit out these results and it's going to, you know, really mm -hmm. help us. And, and they're realizing, no, it takes, it takes a lot of time. It takes yes. a lot of money and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of attention to all of these kind of um, things that have to go along with it to ensure that people's constitutional rights are being protected. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so with that, and here's a segue question um, to you, Julia, and then I'll come back to you, Eric, with a question on um, bias in the, in the data itself. But Julia, how does the review process look like for the adoption of a risk assessment tool? And, you know, you mentioned about audit <laughs> and, and how is the tool then audited um, to be objective, if it's audited, to be objective, if, and I think there's a lot of question around reliability um, and the decisions being made. So can you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually one thing I learned in my reporting that I thought was so surprising was that the way these tools are validated is after they are in use. So essentially you put the tool into use and then like two years minimum, but sometimes many, many years later is when the validation study comes out because you need actually time to see if people were recidivated in order to do the accuracy. So they use the score and then they, and Jessica, you can correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I learned in my reporting. You're much closer to it, but like mm -hmm. that, you know, the place that started the compass piloted with, you know, they, um, in New York state, they, uh, implemented the tool and they did their validation study 12 years later, right? And it's not unusual actually. So what's weird about it is it's very, um, it's very much tested live. And then after they've collected the data and have enough money, that jurisdiction will then join the outcomes with the scores and see, are they accurate? Are they not, et cetera. You know, the, the, when I was doing my reporting, a lot of them were not looking at racial bias. I'm hopeful that maybe, maybe that's changed and people maybe now are including that more often in their studies, but um, it wasn't, it was, they were looking at it only in terms of uh, predictive accuracy and not in terms of false positives and false negatives at that time. And, um, and so I think it's a little weird that this thing is tested in operation and not before, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like a beta mm -hmm. test on us. And then it's actually run live on people's real lives and mm -hmm. often for uh, many, many years before. And then in terms of independent analysis, they're just really, it's really hard to do this work. Like even the jurisdictions, the very not every jurisdiction does a validation study because it's an enormous amount of effort. Broward County was actually really grateful that we did this for them because oh. we had to take, you know, they have a special computer that Compass gave them that was the scores. And then they have their other computers with the rest of the criminal records. And like actually joining them, we had to do it by name and birth date. And it's like an enormous data cleaning task. Oh yeah. It's and so that. they had just never done it. And so we was like, oh, thank you for, you know, finally looking at this for us. And a lot of jurisdictions just don't have the ability to do that sophisticated um, work. It takes data analysis skills. It takes computer programmers. And a lot of them are really strapped for resources. So I think in general, my experience was there's just enormous lack of independent oversight and um, in this field, which is, I think, disturbing for something that has such high human stakes. Mm, okay. So bringing Eric back into the, the conversation. So we're hearing that these, these need to be well-resourced. You need resources and not just dollars, but talent um, and skill set. Um, and which Eric that brings us back to some of what we know as in computing as some of the biases associated um, with this. And we started it out by saying, this is not just the data bias issue, right? And so what I'm hearing from Jessica and Julia is are things like automation bias, confirmation bias, interaction bias. Um, what's the opportunity you think uh, for the field to address some of these issues when it comes to 
uh, pretrial detention. Yeah, uh, um, I, I was actually. This is a con this is somewhat a provocative statement. I'm going to ask um, related to this actually, uh, but I've heard uh, th this argument made by someone else, which I'm not going to quote. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is: Is it easier to correct biases uh, in human decision making as it is to correct biases in algorithmic decision making? Mm -hmm. And that's a question I think that we should address as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think the advantage of biases in algorithmic decision making is that it's it's written in rules it's it we know what the program does we know what the machine learning algorithms do at least we most of them we can understand uh, not not all of them the deep learning is a bit more more of a challenge so we we, we do understand we also understand uh, the data and the limitations of the data and we can think about how to correct that uh, i should also f mention that I, i'm a little bit um, not so happy about these narrow uh, risk assessment discussions that we have that are just based on is the prediction of the person being released going to commit another crime uh, or a crime? Is that true or not? That's a very no narrow risk assessment uh, that does not include the costs to the individual, to the society, etc. So if we're actually thinking about correcting biases and looking at bigger picture, which is coming back to my original presentation, we have to think about costs that are just more than the prediction of the actual outcome of a crime. Uh, we should think about uh, what it actually means for the individual and for the family and for the society. And those costs are very different across the, the country. Uh, and so that was, uh, Jessica was sort of alluding to that, that, that you cannot compare San Francisco with, with right. Broward County or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yes, we, we need to educate people, um, I think. You can see that universities, since I'm a university, we are all, <laughs> most of us, uh, our university professors kind of think about what's going on in our own world. But you see a lot of data scientists uh, being formed. The, univer the universities are creating a lot of data science um, uh, programs. Domain knowledge is important, however. Absolutely. So blanket applications of machine learning as mathematical tools abstract from any sort of context is a no-go, I think. Mm -hmm. So when we're actually talking about training people, yes, I think it's useful to train them in data science, but they also have to be trained lawyers or economists, or I mean, it has to be paired with uh, areas of expertise. And uh, that's not an easy task, but I think it's a task that universities and other educational institutions should address uh, to actually make um, the tools that, that we have at least better understandable. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching in a business school. Uh, business students aren't really interested in, in the math uh, underlying all these models. That's for my PhD courses and for my PhD students. But as when I teach the, P the MBA courses uh, to business uh, students, I, under, I give them the intuition. That what are the shortcomings? Where are the corners that are cut? Uh, those kind of things, those are important for decision makers to know uh, in order to use those tools. So I think it's a big challenge for the educational sector, including the universities, to actually address uh, the teaching of machine learning and data science uh, to a, a wider audience, but not necessarily getting bogged down with all the technical stuff because nobody is going to ever uh, be, be, it's going to create an aversion to the implementation of these algorithms. If hey, we can, can I jump yes, in with yes. a comment? Yes, I've been, I've been, I've been holding out on this comment, but so it's, it's, it's a, it's a big picture comment and it's, mm -hmm. I don't have any objection to looking to cost benefits of detention release decisions. I think it would be incredibly informative for us to know that, but it is really important for us to understand that under our constitution, there are a limited set of reasons that you can detain someone pre-trial. And it it's not 
whether, you know, I may not have even done anything, but maybe I'm the next future criminal and Eric's amazing algorithm can predict me, you still can't detain me because of something I might do in the future and that, and, and, the, and the justifications for pretrial detention are the danger of injury that you present to a person, the risk of non-appearance, and the risk mm -hmm. that you will interfere with the criminal proceeding through intimidation of witnesses and the like. So it is just really important to keep those things in mind, the the sort of the legal guardrails that yeah, exist, yeah, the yeah, decision, yeah, and the justifiable and non-justifiable reasons that yeah. might be offered to detain an individual pretrial. I mean, this is why we have to have conversations uh, about, that involve people with expertise in different fields. Interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. it must be. Absolutely. Uh, Julia. I, I saw that you were going to say something. I just I want to say, like, I told, I couldn't agree more with Jessica on that point. And I just want to add, I've said this already, but I think it's worth really re-emphasizing. This is not a prediction of future criminality. This is a prediction of future arrest. Mm -hmm. yes. And arrests yes. are very political and racially biased. And we know that already. Yes. And so, like, when I, I would just really like the word future criminal to be taken out of any discussion about this. It is not about that, right? And so even if it was a perfect tool, that is not what it is predicting. There are many crimes that are not prosecuted and those crimes are committed by white people. <laughs> and that's just a fact, right? And like yeah. there are many things that are arrest people are arrested for that aren't crimes <laughs> and they get off on later. And so I just, I really don't want this to be just a discussion to, to even imply that that prediction is about actually the reality of criminal behavior, <laughs> that's all. Sorry, and then a I know a little bit we, of a jihad on my part. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. And then I think we have like one minute. Only thing <laughs> that I'm going to say before I turn it back to you, Eric, is to say, I hope that when we're having these discussions, we can center, if this is a discussion on race equity, that we start with that lens from the beginning, whether it's with the data set, whether it's with the design of the software, whether it's creating the algorithm, whether it's running the machine, uh, whatever it may be, if we continue with that thread all the way through, keeping in mind what Jessica is talking about in terms of you know, the constitution and the guardrails that are needed, I think that would be um, a most helpful approach as opposed to thinking about it after the fact. And um, unfortunately that tends to have um, downsides to uh, particular populations, particularly black and brown and low income people. And so I think that that is really important. Um, Eric, I'll send it back to you. I think we well, have maybe, one minute. Yeah, yeah but there is there are a bunch of questions and maybe I'll take one of them. Uh, okay, okay, uh, good. It says in healthcare, criminal trials are used before ah. intervention is approved for general use. Oh, that's What is the equivalent in this area? And I think, uh, I mean, this is perhaps a question more for Jessica than, it's also a question I had for her actually. How do these different counties decide that they reject the Virginia tool, or what is the what is sort of the these arguments that are could be similar to what clinical trials would be, essentially? Um, well, in response in response to the to the the question that 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 was that was asked in the in the chat box, I mean, in theory. I suppose what you could do is you could go into historical records and you right. could risk assess people and then you could check their outcomes and you could do it retroactively. Of course, none of that builds in what the mm. judge actually does with the risk assessment tool and the decision that's ultimately made. But in any event, um, so, but, but I think Eric, you were asking about why do jurisdictions reject using the empirical that's risk right. assessment that's tools? Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't wanna speak for them but I've worked with several jurisdictions that have have declined to use them. And it was really a constellation of factors. One was um, a, a concern that, um, uh, well, let me tell you what they opted for. They opted for a very a, a structured decision-making tool mm -hmm. that walked the, um, the judge or the magistrate through a series of individualized factors about the defendant and the circumstances of the particular case. And in one of those jurisdictions, I heard a 
judge who was on a different webinar with me argue really quite passionately that she felt that that was the right approach, that our law requires an individualized approach that looks at an individual, each defendant individually and each defendant's individual circumstances and the circumstances of the case under the new structured decision-making tool that they adopted and simply wasn't comfortable going with some kind of, some kind of other approach. Um, the other thing is there's just a lot of concern. I mean, there's a lot of discussion in the media nationally about are there bias issues and there's war in camps. Um, you know, you know, I, Julia has eloquently articulated her 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 point and I work with other folks who come out the other way, you know, and who, who would argue contrary. Again, I don't have a dog in that fight, but I think mm -hmm. there's some concern about that. And I also mentioned also the risk, the risk assessment in terms of litigation risk. There are lawsuits going on around the country challenging different aspects of our money-based bail system. And mm -hmm. folks that are involved in those lawsuits have indicated that they do not believe that using these types of tools are the appropriate way to go. So that's a factor that a jurisdiction also potentially would consider. I don't have a dog in this fight either. So I just wanted to finish by saying that. <laughs> um, and uh, I think what is also clear is that we, we talked for an hour and we're not done with this conversation uh, yeah. by no means. Uh, but in any way, uh, we have to end it unfortunately here. Thanks for all of you uh, to participate. This was a wonderful discussion. Thank you, uh, Julia, Jessica, and Faye. This was uh, a great event. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you.